Hi everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to um, the ICS, our Webster lecture this year. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Carol Doherty from Wellesley College, and I have brought a prop for my introduction because I first became aware of Carol's work when this book was published in 1998, um, and as an, an undergraduate who was learning Greek and first learning about archaic Greek culture and archaic Greek poetry. And it really opened up a world for me, so much so that I bought a copy of it, which I <laughs> have, um, as proof. Um, and particularly in its kind of vision of interdisciplinarity and the way in which, um, in order to understand cultures like uh, archaic Greece, we need to bring together literary perspectives, historical perspectives, anthropology, and of course, theoretically informed comparative scholarship. Um, and that's really been a theme, I think, of Professor Doherty's work. Another book of hers that I admire and use with my students is for After the Odysseus about the ethnographic imagination of Homer's Odyssey, um, which again brings together comparative perspectives, thinking about travel, thinking about mobility. I really appreciate the way um, you bring into that book also Derek Walcott's poetry. Um, that's uh, right, after. <laughs> Right, and um, um, I, I, I think some of some of these themes, um, themes of hospitality, themes of mobility, themes of immigration, themes of colonialism, are of course very current and very important in classics today. But Carol, you've been um, working on them um, for a long time, and 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 bringing ancient and more contemporary material into a sort of mutually informing perspective. So not thinking of reception as the kind of secondariness or indebtedness of contemporary poetry, um, for example, but, but really thinking about how we can use ancient and contemporary perspectives to inform each other. Um, and I noticed that you have a 2019 book as well, which I don't have a copy of, <laughs> um, on travel and home in Homer and contemporary literature. Um, which also, I think, pursues this, this comparatism. Um, Carol is with us only for two weeks. It's a flying visit as our, as our Webster Fellow, but we're um, absolutely delighted that she was able to reschedule a long-delayed trip. And we'll also be participating in the Literature Colloquium, which I think is on the 23rd of May, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but today she's going to talk to us about some of her current research on Metoikia and Athenian tragedy. So I will hand over to Carol for, as if a stranger at the door, figuring justice as Metoikia in East Phillips's first dial. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Introduction and it's good to see that cultural poetic still. <laughs> it's a um, uh, So the work I want to present today is very much um, new work, or uh, it's work that I've been doing by myself during COVID. Um, so um, this is one of the first opportunities I've had to um, to have a conversation and to get feedback. So I very much look forward to your to your responses. Um, okay. So at the end of Aeschylus' Eumenides, after Athena has finally succeeded in persuading the Athenians to accept her invitation to set aside their anger and stay in Athens, Athena turns to her citizens, encouraging them to welcome the Furies into their city. This is handout one. And you, children of Crinaeus, who dwell in the city, lead the way for these immigrants, and may the citizens think favorably of the favors they are receiving. The word translated by Summerstein here is immigrants, the word that Athena uses to describe the Furies at this moment of welcome is metoikos, and many read its appearance here and elsewhere in Greek tragedy as a reference to metoikia, an Athenian political institution for regulating the movement and residence of, residence of non Athenians, medics, in the city. One that emerged in the 460s in response to extensive post Persian War immigration into Athens. While the historical context certainly is important, Today, I want to read the figure of the Metoikos in tragedy differently, within the framework of hospitality, those cultural norms and ethical practices that govern how we relate to others. I'll argue that rather than reflecting recent civic legislation concerning immigration and citizenship, tragedy actively participates in its formation 
helping its audience negotiate the much thornier ethical dilemmas at the heart of Athens' struggles with the parameters of democratic self-rule. Hospitality is central to the Athenian tragic experience at all levels, contextual, historical, and thematic. The city Dionysia, the festival at which Athenian tragedy was performed, welcomed the god Dionysus into the theater with a grand reception. Procession, feasting, dramatic storytelling, one that compensated ritually for the welcome that, according to myth, he was originally denied. In addition, the festival offered the Athenians the opportunity to host thousands of visitors, citizens, medics, foreigners, ambassadors, for a week-long display of civic hospitality. And so even as Athenian tragedy has been said to function as a fundamentally democratic institution, it's also very much concerned with the foreign experience. As Pierre vidal Mackay has noted, all but four of the 33 extant tragedies are set in non-Athenian locales. And even those that are set in Athens focus on the reception of foreign refugees on Athenian soil. So what is the connection between tragedy's democratic origins and its attention to foreign affairs? Indeed, as Bonnie Honig has observed, quote, democracy is always about living with strangers under a law that is therefore alien. Even at its very best, or especially so, democracy is about being mobilized into action periodically with and on behalf of people who are surely opaque to us, often unknown to us. And so along these lines, I have found that recent work by Jacques Derrida and others on hospitality provides a productive framework for thinking about tragedy's engagement with the foreign in ways that also acknowledge the genre's democratic interests. And so before turning to how we might read the figure of the medic in Oris the Oristaya, we want to take a few minutes to lay out what's useful about the discourse of hospitality for this project. So I've put the relevant passages in handout too. As a structure that regulates relationships between self and others, hospitality is a material, is material, it's a temporary sharing of space. It's also overlaid with affective elements, gratitude, generosity, and imbued with ethical force. The decisions we make about how to live well and with others. Since hospitality takes place at the threshold of a series of oppositions, both literal and figural, inside, outside, public, private, family, stranger, the practice is inherently self-contradictory. When I welcome a guest into my home, for example, is it because she's a family friend and therefore someone with whom I have an obligation based on a prior relationship? Or is the very essence of hospitality what we might call an open door policy, an unconditional welcome to the absolute stranger whose very lack of personal connection to me makes her request all the more urgent and my obligation even more necessary? In other words, do I welcome her conditionally because she's family or unconditionally because she's not? Second, while certainly an expression of generosity, the offer of hospitality is also an assertion of mastery and control. You can only welcome someone into your house if it's yours. And yet think of how that invitation is so often limited or constrained. Come on in, but please take off your shoes. Please stay for dinner, but I hope you like fish. When the host says to the guest, make yourself at home, Derrida insists that what this really means is please feel at home, Act as if you're at home, but remember, this is not your home, but mine. And yet, while acts of hospitality offer the promise of mastery over self at home, they also threaten it existentially. For Derrida, unconditional hospitality means that, quote, you have to accept the risk of the other coming and destroying the place, initiating a revolution, stealing everything, or killing everyone. <laughs> These limits and constraints are at the heart of hospitality. How do I reconcile my ethical obligations to others with my reasonable expectations of control over my own family and home? Moreover, for Derrida, the real risk to domestic or community autonomy comes not from welcoming the foreigner at the gates, but from letting a group become too homogeneous. And the ultimate challenge is how to respond to the call of the other without turning it into the same. How to integrate foreigners into the community without erasing their alterity. Instead of cultural homogeneity, Derrida insists that what's proper to a culture is to be different with itself. And he notes the strange and slightly violent syntax that the preposition with enables, one that both gathers and divides. 
We might say that this is the ultimate tension at the heart of hospitality, what Derrida calls the turbulence of the whip. If a community is too welcoming, it loses its sense of self. If it keeps its identity too strictly, it becomes unwelcoming, even authoritarian. How do we live with others and also with difference? Inevitably, these tensions are experienced as impossible choices. And yet, the sense of aporia, or undecidability, that emerges from the contradictions at the heart of hospitality is, according to Derrida, precisely what makes it possible. I don't know what to do. It's not the negative condition of decision. It is rather the possibility of one. For Derrida, well, a decision must be prepared for as far as possible by knowledge. At some point, you just have to go beyond knowledge and do something that you don't know. And so he advocates, quote, a certain experience and experiment of the possibility of the impossible, the testing of the aporia from which one may invent the only possible invention, the impossible invention. Undecidable, the undecidability thus becomes the condition of ethical decision making, a call to responsible action. Derrida's interest in hospitality and its impossibility emerges from what he calls the question of the foreigner by which he does not mean what should we do with them, but rather what are the ways that the foreign puts us in question. His is not a question about the facts of foreignness, but rather a mode of theorizing that figures itself as foreign. And what I want to argue today is that the way that Athenian tragedy poses the question of the foreigner depends upon the figure of the man. Let's start with the word itself. Metoikos, a compound noun comprised of the word for house or household and the preposition meta, is notoriously difficult to translate into English thanks to the undecidability of the Greek prefix meta. Often, the force of meta in a compound is associative. We could easily translate metoikos as one who lives with or among us. As we've seen at the end of the Oresteia, Athena offers the Furies turned Eumenides a shared home as metoikoi in Athens. And yet, meta also designates mobility and change. And Sophocles and Antigone that represents her death as a kind of metoikia. She leaves her home above ground and goes cursed, unmarried, emetic, to find a new home among the dead. Finally, the preposition meta emphasizes a state of ambiguity or in-betweenness. Oedipus appears in Oedipus the king as emetic, neither citizen nor foreigner, both citizen and foreigner. The space in between has a history in the Athenian civic imaginary, one we can trace back to Solon's formulation of his stance as, quote, a boundary stone in the space in between, this is handout three, a no man's land, literally the place between the spheres, the tychmion, as Nicola Rowe has argued, is not the same thing as Thomas Song, a shared space in which civic business is conducted on equal terms. Rather, the force of meta, especially as it appears in Athenian drama, helps represent a dangerous temporary location, what Richard Martin has called demilitarized zone, a place where competing forces or ideologies have come to a standstill with space in between. It is in this intermediary space that the figure of the medic operates within the discourse of hospitality and on the Athenian stage. In this respect, my approach is much to the work of Deborah Cassini's whose 2018 book, The Perpetual Immigrant and the Limits of Athenian Democracy, focus on the figure of the medic as a site of discursive and political theoretical meaning in a range of Athenian contexts dating from the late 5th to the 4th centuries BCE. Whereas many allied the medic with the foreigner, Cassini's reads it as an in-between figure, arguing that as neither citizen nor foreigner, but able to pass as either, the medic's undecidable status helps Athenians interrogate the strategies of inclusion and exclusion that structure their concepts of civic membership. Asking if citizenship is simply the, simply the possession of a legal status inherited by blood, or rather, a particular way of acting made possible by living in the polis. And so by calling our attention to the mimetic force of the medic as a figure for political theory, Cassini's paves the way for reading the medic as a figure of political theory on the tragic stage. Mimesis, mimesis is, of course, central to Athenian tragedy, famously defined by Aristotle as an imitation of action. And it is the performative mimetic quality of the medic, a figure of in-between, neither Greek nor foreign, but able to act as if either, 
that enables the medic's pivotal role within the discourse of hospitality in Athenian drama. Over and over on the tragic stage, Athenian citizens act as if they were Persian potentates, Egyptian girls, or grief-stricken Trojan wives. They perform foreignness, not as the object of concern, a problem to be solved, but as the subject, the one posing the question, the one whose outsider status puts us and our own institutions in question. It's from this liminal perspective that Athenians were able to pose the question of the foreigner, to interrogate their own democratic identity as if the stranger or foreigner held the keys. Like Derrida's turbulent whiff, the prefix meta is simultaneously associative, transitive, and deliberative. And it's the undecidability of this prefix that when combined with the word for house or home, allows Athenians to confront the challenges of living together with difference of living with difference in a democratic city. In other words, medics are good to think with about those institutions that structure democratic identity for Athenians. And reading tragedy within the discourse of hospitality reveals the mimetic, undecidable, turbulent figure of the medic to be essential to the role of tragedy itself as an institution of political theorizing, not just a reflection of political events. In other words, the best way to think with the Metoi boss is to play one on stage. And so with this in mind, let's turn now to Aeschylus' Oristia, a trilogy in which the figure of the medic helps pose the question of the foreigner. And here, that question is about civic justice and its, and its relationship to violent revenge. As many have argued, Aeschylus' Oristia tells the story of justice in the newly democratic city of Athens as the movement away from retaliatory acts of revenge within the House of Atreus and toward the city's first jury trial held on the slopes of the Areopagus. Cladonestra's murder of her husband Agamemnon in response to his sacrifice of their daughter Iphigenia precipitates Orestes' own act of revenge against his mother on behalf of his father. The final play of the trilogy offers a way out of this perpetual cycle of revenge First, through the ritual purification of Orestes by Apollo at Delphi, and second, when Athena convenes the first jury trial in Athens, which votes to acquit Orestes of murder. And yet, we might also tell the story of the Oresteia as one of hospitality, of coming home and keeping house. The failed and fatal homecomings of Orestes and Agamemnon that dominate the first two plays in the trilogy are countered in the final play, which allows Orestes to return at last to Argos. More importantly, after the trial, Athena persuades the Furies, who have followed Orestes to Athens, to relinquish their powers of vengeful destruction by offering them a place to live in their city, a Metoikia. The humanity's conclusion reverses Clytemnestra's perverted welcome of her husband that celebrates the, and celebrates the Furies' transformation into forces of good for the city as itself a welcome home. In other words, the trilogy structures its celebration of justice as a series of homecomings, and the competing trajectories of the trilogy, both in and out of the house, converge at the door, literally the door on stage, and discursively through the figure of the medic. The word metoikos first appears in the Agamemnon's opening choral ode as part of a complicated simile that compares the sons of Atreus setting forth against Troy with a fierce battle cry to a pair of screeching eagles, whose screams of grief on behalf of their abandoned chicks prompts the fury to send forth vengeance. This is handout four. Uttering from their hearts a great cry for war, like birds of prey who, crazed by grief for their children, wheel around high above their eyries, rowing with wings for oars, having seen the toil of watching over their nestlings' beds go for nothing. And some Apollo on high, or Pan, or Zeus, hearing the loud, shrill, wailing cries of the birds, exacts belated revenge on behalf of these metoi boy by sending a fury against the transgressors. The sons of Atreus scream a great cry of warm war from their hearts in the manner of birds of prey. But these fierce birds, we soon find out, are shrieking not only with the rage of battle, but also with lonely grief for their children. They have lost the labor of caring for their chicks and the verb used, olisantes, meaning both to destroy and to lose, enables a slippage between the violence associated with war in the play and grief over the loss of a child, as well as the movement from home to the battlefield and back again. 
As the passage continues, we learn that some god hears the shrill cry of the eagles, who are now called these Metoid boy, and sends a fury, one who brings punishment later, upon the transgressors. The birds who started out as a figure for an aggressive military deployment have thus become a poignant image of the strains on the household, as well as a terrifying figure of revenge. As Gloria Ferrari observes, the questions raised by the eagle's metoikoi metaphor, who are they, why are they screeching, depend upon the kind of lexical and metaphorical ambiguity that multiplies rather than limits meaning. In particular, the ambiguous turbulent prefix that forms the beginning of the compound, the metaness of metoikos, allows for a range of meanings that includes both a core sense of stable family relations within a household structure and the fundamental instability prompted by movement to and from that house. Indeed, two key themes that emerge from the extended simile are movement, the expedition to Troy, vultures hovering over nests, sending revenge, and housekeeping, grief for children tending to their beds. It's precisely the capacity of the term metoikos to represent both mobility and domesticity that both generates and accommodates the tension between the bird's actions of circling over and moving away from the nests of their children. The metoikos both belongs to and moves from the house. Here at the trilogy's opening, then, Eskels activates the undecidability contained within the term metoikos to pose important questions to which he'll repeatedly return over the course of the trilogy. Not just, are they family members or strangers, and what is their relationship to the house, but also, what is the nature of revenge? It is, is it an act of violence or one of protection? From this ambiguously capacious image, Eskles thus frames the trilogy's broader interrogation of justice within the contradictions of hospitality. After the eagle simile, the word metokos does not appear again in the Agamemnon. In its place, the themes of mobility and domesticity that the startling image invokes are embodied in the house, the Scania building that Aeschylus has put on stage to represent the house of Atreus. The action of the Agamemnon repeatedly calls our attention to the house's physical presence, focusing in particular on Clytemnestra's obsessive attention to the door through which she controls all movement in and out of the house. For the 10 years that Agamemnon has been at Troy, Clytemnestra has been moving at home, not as the Penelopean figure of domestic nurture that she imitates on stage, but rather as righteous anger. This is handout five. A fearsome, guileful keeper of the house, a wrath that remembers and will avenge a child. As she tells Orestes later, it's really hard to stay home without a husband. And where Penelope had been carefully Lever regarding all of Odysseus's possessions within her house, Clytemnestra was nurturing revenge for her murdered daughter. When Agamemnon returns at last, Clytemnestra greets him at the door, and her control of the house and all that happens within is directly linked to her ability to welcome Agamemnon, as well as to the limits and constraints that she imposes upon that act of hospitality. After an excessively fulsome tribute, Clytemnestra bids her servants to strew her husband's path with exotic blood-red tapestries in honor of his return. Agamemnon initially resists, appropriately rejecting both her unctuous speech and the tapestry-strewn path. This is handout six. Such decadence befits a woman or a barbarian who would certainly surely incur the envy of the gods. Revere me like a man who says, not a god. But against his better judgment, and that of most commentators, he eventually agrees. And I want to say that why he agrees is not the point. What is important is that we linger outside the house while he struggles with his decision. That we experience Agamemnon's dilemma as an impossible choice. That we watch him strain against the contradictions of hospitality represented by the door that Clytemnestra guards. For Agamemnon's dilemma reminds us, of course, of that other impossible choice that the Greek leader had to make. One that pitted the welfare of the Greek army against that of his own child. Which of these choices is without evils, the chorus wonders. And now Agamemnon, having successfully fulfilled his military responsibilities abroad, returns home only to face the consequences of that decision to sacrifice his daughter. Standing at the door, the literal threshold of his political and domestic responsibilities, he's once again at a loss. Which of these choices is without evils? And then, 
Adam Nostra gives him a way out of his impasse. This is handout seven. Surely Priam would do so, she suggests. Surely you deserve to be envied. Surely you can give way to a woman. She gives him a way out of his dilemma and a way into the house. As Derrida suggests, aquaria is not simply a paralysis, the non-way, but also the condition of walking. And Clytemnestra offers her husband a path, a poros, to walk, one that is strewn with crimson. The scene that began with Clytemnestra's call for justice, it began with Clytemnestra's call for justice, one that is framed within the discourse of hospitality. On handout eight, she says, to her maidservants, let his way forthwith be spread with crimson, so that justice may lead him into a home he never hoped to see. And yet it's Clytemnestra, the housekeeping spirit of revenge, not justice, who plays the role of hostess. She leads her husband, the Greek general, across the blood-red tapestries as if he were a barbarian king. And her act of welcoming the master as if he were a foreigner represents her act of bloody revenge as if it were justice. This is certainly not the homecoming, nor the justice that Agamemnon was expecting, even as it invokes and inverts Derrida's articulation of absolute hospitality to welcome the unexpected, no matter what or who it is, no matter if it destroys you. Once she's gotten her revenge, Madame Nestor tries to shut the front door, to stay in control of this house she has kept, saying as she and Aegisthus retreat off stage and back inside the home at the end of the first play, you and I are controlling the house and we'll set all this in order. And yet the door that Clytemnestra guards so masterfully in the first play no longer represents a strong barrier between inside and outside, nurture and mobility, family and stranger in the second. It no longer asserts or maintains her authority within the house. Instead, the libation barriers focuses on the door's capacity to open and shut, to facilitate movement in and out of the house, representing the instability of those distinctions. In the Agamemnon, Clytemnestra persuades her husband, the master of the house, to enter their home as if he were a foreign potentate. Here in the second play, her son Orestes tricks his mother into welcoming him home as if he were a stranger. As he explains to his sister, he will exploit his long absence from home and imitate the stranger, the Xenos, that he has in fact become, returning to his native Mycenae, which dressed as a foreigner. This is handout nine. In the guise of a traveler from abroad with a full set of baggage, I'll come to the front door with this man, Pylades. He's bound to this house by hospitality and alliance. Both of us will speak with an accent from Parnassus, imitating the sound of the Phocian dialect. Even though by blood he's the ultimate insider, Agamemnon's only son, Orestes, approaches his own house as a literal outsider, standing at the door, looking like a stranger, speaking with a foreign accent, and accompanied by a friend, Pylades, whose name puns on the very gates, Pulas, that they face. The door separates the Philoi, those who sh whose shared experiences and relationships define them as family, from those strangers, Senoi, who stand outside and threaten to disrupt the familiar world within. The play exploits the ambiguity of relationships that stem from Orestes' displacement from his home by staging a confrontation at the physical door of the house, from which he's been excluded. After knocking three times at the home, at the door of his ancestral home, Orestes is greeted by his mother. She addresses him and his companion as strangers and generously offers them hospitality, warm baths, soft beds. Orestes replies in kind, falsely identifying himself as a stranger on an errand to bring the news of Orestes' death to his family. He's brought his ashes home in a bronze urn and asks Clytemnestra how he should proceed. This is handout 10. Whether it turns out that the preferred decision in his family is to bring him home, or whether to bury him as a metoikos, a permanent and perpetual alien, please convey back here their instructions about this. If Clytemnestra refuses to bring her dead son home, the disguised Orestes maintains, he'll remain forever a stranger, a metoikos. While Orestes' stories about his story about his death may be a fiction, his status as a medic is not. Standing at the door, stranded between the categories of living and dead, family and stranger. So rather than separating the philoi from the strangers, 
Here, the door contributes to the confusion of those categories, repeatedly opening and shutting, facilitating an unprecedented number of entrances and exits in and out of the house of Atreus. In response to his mother's offer of hospitality, Orestes uses the term xenos five times in seven lines. This is handout 11. I would have wished to make the acquaintance of such prosperous hosts and to be entertained by them as a bringer of good news. For what friendship is there greater than that of host and guest? But I would have thought of an act of impiety to fail to complete such a task for my friends, having agreed to, do, having agreed to and having been welcomed as a guest. And with a speech that drips with irony, Phyllis responds by reassuring Orestes that he's no less welcome to this house than if he were a member of the family. Orestes' homecoming has been rewritten somewhere in between the rules governing guests and hosts and those that define family relations. His true identity is both confirmed and estranged by his act of violence, one that reasserts his role in the family by avenging his father's death precisely as he alienates himself further from it by killing his mother. As the familiar stranger, Orestes both supports and endangers the integrity and cohesion of his house. His strong attachment to his white boss, manifested by his determination to return home to avenge his father's death, is complicated by a fundamental uncertainty attached to his relationship to home, expressed by his status as an exile, literally displaced, destined to kill his mother. And Aeschylus calls upon the term Metroid boss to capture the ambivalence surrounding Orestes' relationship to home. The Agamemnon characterizes Clytemnestra's act of revenge as if it were one of justice, by representing Agamemnon walking upon a blood-red path as if he were a foreigner, once again transgressing the proper boundaries between home and the external world. The libation bearers figures Orestes' response in more ambiguous terms. Together with the virtual revolving door at which he stands, Orestes' characterization as the medic, rather than the foreigner, poses the question of the foreigner. It interrogates the boundaries between stranger and family, as well as those between revenge and justice. Is he killing a family member or a stranger? Is but another way to ask if the murder of Clytemnestra is an act of revenge or one of justice. All of this anticipates, of course, Apollo's argument in Orestes' defense that as mother, Clytemnestra is not family, but rather a stranger. In the Eumenides, the door, a symbol of hospitality that has been such a dominant force in the first two plays, disappears from view, as the action abandons the physical house of Atreus and moves first to Delphi and then to an open-air courtroom on the Areopagus. As Rush Rem has argued, the trilogy's innovative staging thus reinforces its thematic shift from Clytemnestra's act of family revenge to Orestes' acquittal by the Athenian law court, located literally out of doors. In other words, Aeschylus puts the house on stage in the Agamemnon precisely so he can take it away at the trilogy's conclusion. Even so, the contradictions at the heart of hospitality and justice that the house and its door represent in the first two plays remain essential to the solution, the offer of Metoikia, that's forged in the conclusion. The trilogy began with Agamemnon's dilemma, and it ends with Athena's own uncertainty about how to decide between the competing demands of Orestes, whose status as a purified suppliant must be respected, and the Furies, whose power to bring great destruction to her city, if they are defeated, cannot be discounted. She's at a loss. She's all made manos. Should she send them away or let them stay? Both choices are fraught with uncertainty and disaster. Her first response is to establish a tribunal in which Orestes will be tried and judged by a jury of the best of the Athenian citizens. And yet the fact that their vote is tied reinforces rather than eradicates the impossibility and the necessity of her decision. Once Orestes has been acquitted and sent back to Argos, however, her work really begins, and Athena turns her full attention to the defeated Furies, now livid with rage and threatening to set their anger loose upon her city. Athena begs the Furies to let their anger go. Again and again, she insists they will still be honored and respected. If they can set aside their bitter rage, she offers them a new home, a seat of honor, a place to live among her Athenians as members of the family. Literally, she offers to let them share her home. This is handout 12. Well, to rest the bitter force of the black surge, think of yourselves as being held in august honor and as shares of my home. Assume oiketator, oiketator. 
Again and again, they reject her offer, insisting upon their age-old rights, vowing to hold on to a destructive wrath on behalf of family, threatening to let loose a venomous poison upon the Athenian land. But Athena persists, and with a persuasive tenacity reminiscent of Clytemnestra's efforts to persuade Agamemnon to walk across the tapestries, Athena enumerates the benefits they'll gain, including an ownership portion of the Athenian land. This is number 13. It's possible for you to have the opportunity to be a landholder in the city and to be justly honored forever. This last offer finally catches their attention, and the chorus asks, what kind of seat did you say I could have? To which Athena asks, one answers, one free from all pain and distress, urging them to accept her hospitality, deku desu. The chorus wants to be sure about the limits to this offer, saying, suppose I do accept it. What privileges await me? To which Athena replies that no house will prosper without their aid, and in the end, the fear is acquiesced, saying, I will accept a residence with palace, literally a shared home, Sunoikian. Like Clytemnestra, Athena asserts her control over her city through an act of hospitality by welcoming the furies. And yet, while in the Agamemnon, Clytemnestra welcomed her husband home as if a foreigner, dressing up her act of revenge as if it were justice, here, Athena does the opposite. She welcomes these alienating forces of revenge into her home as if they were family, telling them they could stay and live in the city with her citizens. She welcomes them not as family, but as if. The trilogy concludes with the celebration of their new productive role in the city, and to return to the passage with which we began, we see that Athena bids her citizens to escort the former Furies off stage, not as housemates, soon oiktator, soon oiktator, as previously suggested, but as metoi boy. And you, children of Carnaeus who dwell in the city, lead the way for these metoi boy, and may the citizens think favorably of the favors they are receiving. Faced with an impossible choice, how to accommodate the Furies and the violent revenge they represent without destroying her city, Athena finds a middle ground. Her initial offer of hospitality and their subsequent acceptance of it was one of sunoikia, a compound that combines the word for a home with soon, a prefix that unambiguously designates togetherness. Wives are often called sunoikoi. To represent her offer of their new abode as a shared home, their new role as members of the family. And in this respect, Athena's subsequent enjoinder to her citizens that they welcome the Furies as metoi koi represents a subtle but significant change. It's all about the prefixes. As Bachelard says, this is handout 15, sometimes prefixes learn to think for themselves. By replacing the unambiguously associative soon with the turbulently undecidable meta, Athena urges her citizens to welcome the Furies neither as family nor as strangers, but as something in between, as metoikoi. Where the tapestry scene in the Agamemnon embodied the impossibility of Agamemnon's ability to find a solution to his domestic dilemma, here the absence of a physical house on stage points the way to Athena's more productive decision, a way, a poros, to accommodate the will for revenge within a productive civic context, a way to domesticate the Fury's destructive powers of revenge a way to recast them as forces of justice. The obstacle that Athena pushes through, her way out of the dilemma of justice and revenge, is figured here as Metoikia. And by contrast to that of Agamemnon, the humanity's mode of walking is not transgressive, but processional. They wear festal robes of scarlet instead of trampling upon them. The trilogy concludes as the Furies, once again invoked as Metoikoi, together with Athena's citizens and accompanied by the goddess herself, march down a torch-lit path that leads them to their new home so they may always bring prosperity to the Athenian land and its people. And yet, like the birds of prey with which we began, the furies here of the trilogy's conclusion straddle the line between violence and justice, between care for the home and desire for revenge. Athena's way out of the dilemma that the furies pose for her city her invention of Metoikia is, of course, as Derrida would say about all inventions forged from the apparatus of hospitality, an impossible. Are we persuaded that the discursive potential of Metoikia has successfully negotiated a path to justice, 
Or do we fear that the forces of revenge still wait in the house, as did Clytemnestra, having taken on the mere trappings of justice, the robes of the medic? Indeed, in a recent talk on fury and justice in the humanities, Judith Butler turned to Aeschylus's humanities to pose a similar question about the nature of the system of justice on offer at the end of the play. Butler revisits the once canonical reading of the Oristia that celebrates the triumph of justice over violence as the unproblematic transition from darkness to light, embodied by the transformation of the Furies into the humanities. By contrast, Butler argues that the play calls attention to our desire for law, for the legal form that fury or violence can take, the role that violence plays in developing and supporting the rules that bind a community together. Arguing that we return to the play anew in the contemporary context of anti-carceral politics, in light of recent skepticism about due process emerging from the Me Too movement or cases of police brutality, Butler sees an opportunity to reconsider the relationship between law and violence in the play, especially the emergence of legal violence as the inevitable alternative to extra-legal revenge. Butler argues that the play offers insights into how law, rather than overturning violence, often subsumes it into its own operations. Noting that what she sees as the ease was with, with which the Furies relinquish their threats of grievous harm to Athens and agree to work with Athena to become Lars Law's partner rather than its adversary, Butler asks whether the Furies give up passion in favor of dispassionate jurisprudence, or rather, does their passion, their fury, merely take a new form, now tasked as they are, working within the legal system? In other words, what may have started out as a conflict between the Fury's anger and the system of law is ultimately resolved only, Butler contends, by absorbing the Fury's violence into the law, bringing to this new institution their prior capacity to generate fear and rendering the law itself an instrument of violence. Butler concludes by urging us to push back against this logic, to read the text against itself, beyond itself, to find in the view that violence inheres in the law a counter trend, one that calls instead for a sense of justice by which the legal system itself can be judged, a reading that asks if the humanities might even help us with our own anger over legal violence. Might this theory be indispensable, Butler asks, in developing an alternative, restorative, rather than punitive view of justice in the future? So I'd like to conclude by suggesting that Butler's critique of the humanities as a text that engages with the relationship of violence, law, fury, and grief, along with her call to ethical action, aligns with what I've been trying to argue here about the discursive force of Metoikia in Athenian tragedy, about reading the Oristia within a discourse of hospitality. As Derrida notes, there's always hostility at the heart of hospitality. And I've tried to suggest that the trilogy draws upon the mimetic potential of the figure of the medic to pose this interrogation of justice as the question of the foreigner. What happens if we disguise the violence or revenge as if it were legal justice? Can we make a home for fury? Where is its place in the city? Far from erasing the presence of violence within this new legal system, the figure of the medic works from the position of in-between to interrogate the systems of justice and their problematic relationship to revenge, to represent the instability of whatever boundaries the trilogy has tried to erect between revenge and justice within the newly established city. Above all, reading tragedy within the discourse of hospitality reveals its force, then and still now to judge from Butler's reading, as itself a form of political theorizing. By representing the solution to questions about the role of violence and revenge within the judicial, judicial system as a form of metoikia, a framework in which the alien and alienating force of violence is accommodated and yet never fully domesticated, the Oristai acknowledges the impossibility of this invention precisely as it provides a framework for trying to reconcile the contradictions at its core, as well as to underscore the ethical imperative for the attempt. For the one place that I take issue with Butler's reading of the humanities has to do with what she considers the speed with which the Furies take Athena's deal. That's never been my experience of reading the play. And in fact, it takes Athena nearly as many lines to persuade the Furies to leave off of their violence as it takes to represent the trial scene itself. 
Rather, I'm always struck by how hard she has to work to persuade them. And I read her extended efforts as both a reflection of the impossibility of the choices, violence or law, revenge or justice, and the opportunity for us, the audience, to experience that aporia, that undecidability, to push against the limits, the boundaries, the constraints, as the only way to imagine the impossible invention, that new form of justice beyond the unjust law. As Derrida suggests, the ultimate and ethical challenge is how to welcome the other without turning it into the same, how to respond to the need to address violence without ourselves becoming violent. Far from opposing undecidability to decision, there would be no decision in the strong sense of the word, in ethics, in politics, no decision, and thus no responsibility without the experience of some undecidability. Without it, Derrida contends, the decision would simply be the application of a program, the consequence of a premise. A decision has to go through some impossibility in order for it to be a decision. By structuring the conclusion of the humanities in terms of the paradoxical relationship between a conditional look of the theories as if family into the city and legal system of Athens and the threat of their unconditional, uninvited arrival as strangers, Eskils locates Athena's aporia at the threshold of community and violence, law and revenge, grief and fear. Lingering as she does, he does upon the scene, allowing us to witness Athena's uncertainty as she experiments with a host of ways out of her dilemma and that of her city, Aeschylus allows the audience to experience this <coughs> undecidability as the testing of the aporia from which, to quote Derrida again, they may invent the impossible invention a way to acknowledge rage at, not as, acts of violence, as a legitimate, not irrational response to unacceptable grief and loss, a way to develop a form of justice whose integrity and sovereignty does not itself inflict the violence it aims to address, a way to, build, to bind a community together without resorting to fear. Thank you.